Welcome, everyone. Hello. I'm Pam Franks, and I have had the great privilege of serving as the curator of the Redoubt exhibition. And it is my honor, my true honor now, to introduce Matthew Barney. <laughs> you know, I don't think I fully anticipated the um, um, unsettling experience of following the screening with a talk back. Um, the film is such a powerful visual and auditory and nonverbal experience. And so the idea of a talk back has felt a little more daunting to me. Applause feels just right. It's physical, <laughs> it's embodied, it's contact. It's a great show of appreciation and um, uh, really just resonates with the film. I think you have brought us with Redoubt, Matthew, um, into a fully immersive experience of the stunning sawtooth mountain landscape of Idaho. And that is very visual. All of the vistas framed by the film, all of the um, incredible aerial photography and views down onto the land. And then for me, especially the embodied points of view where the figures in the film move through the landscape. There is an incredible immersiveness for those of us watching the film through um, all of these different points of view. And that experience is also auditory. So the ambient sounds of the wind and the snow, um, the bubbling and dripping of the liquid, as if you know, we're in the space. But for me, the part of the auditory experience that's most powerful are the sounds made by contact, the footsteps in the snow, that incredible moment with the woodpecker on the tree, um, those, those moments when the sound results from one object coming in contact with another. And that, that sort of um, uh, defines a sort of structure. There are two stories that unfold in this film, and they're really magically intertwined. The story of the hunt that unfolds over the duration of the film, and of course, the story of art making and of representing the landscape that we're so fully immersed in. So I thought to start this conversation, what we might do is, um, if you're up for it, talk a little bit about the, where it started for you, the origins, and perhaps the most um, logical place to start is with the title mm -hmm. and the notion of redoubt and what inspired you um, about that concept. Um, how you came to it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Upper Doubt is a, it's a military fortification, although a small one. Uh, and um, I think it also has the flexibility of being used as a kind of um, place of isolation or uh, a way of thinking that's isolated from the kind of common... Um, uh, way of thinking, and um, and so that having grown up in in Idaho, I think that there there's something about the sort of geographical isolation there and geological isolation that was always very powerful to me as a young person, and um, and it's also a, a place with that isolation that that um, has. Uh, well, it's kind of given rise to a number of, um, uh, let's say, um, alternative philosophies, um, ways of life, um, ways of thinking. Um, and so the, the word redoubt became compelling to me as a way of kind of um, capturing these different feelings I had about that place, mm -hmm. uh, both geographically and geologically and also ideologically. Um, well, you've really um, created a magnificent portrait of that place, and it's so—it's such a 
focus. We are for two hours um, in this place in such a um, deliberate and um, kind of um, sustained way. And I think the notion, you know, when I said it's a little unsettling to think about turning now to uh, discussion and, and verbalizing some of this, Unsettling, though, is a word that actually does occur to me in this film, and it has everything to do with the beauty of the place and the sheer beauty of this work and the kind of um, pairing of that beauty with, with the problematic or the disturbing. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there is something I wanted to capture um, about that place, if we, if we could say that Redoubt is in some ways a portrait of central Idaho, which I would say that it is, I wanted for that portrait to include the, the um, um, contradictions in that area, the, the sort of um, the political divide that runs deep through that state and always has. And, um, um, and I think it landed for me uh, on the topic of the wolf hunt and, and the reintroduction of wolves, which happened when I was a teenager there. And it was something that, uh, that divided the state in a pretty radical way. It was a very hot topic there. And, um, um, and I think one that gave, at least gave me some kind of clarity on the way in which things were divided there. And, uh, um, but it also had a kind of mythological um, component to it in, in that you know, wolves sort of carry this sort of uh, mythic um, weight with them. And so um, there's a lot of uh, um, sort of bigger ideas that people bring to the to the conversation about wolves. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about wolves. There's, um, you know, they're kind of mythological in their, um, um, their way of being in that, in that way. And uh, so I think it was uh, through the, the uh, reintroduction of wolves and eventually the, hunt, the hunting of wolves, which was then legalized in the state, that I found my way back to the, the narrative of, of Diana and, um, um, and the, um, you know, the myth of, of Diana and Acteon. That's great. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, how did you cast the film? Mm -hmm. Uh, well... It certainly started with Diana, and, um... And I started looking at various um, competitive sharpshooters, mm -hmm. uh, and and specifically long range sharpshooters, and um, and I and there's a lot online. You know, you can find a lot of competitors and interviews with them, and uh, so I. I started looking into uh, Annette that way and then went out to meet her and uh, brought a piece of copper, set it up on a <laughs> shooting range and asked her to, to, you know, shoot it on edge and she split a bullet in half on it. Wow. And I was like, <laughs> you're hired. <laughs> um, but I was, I mean, one thing that was, that was quite compelling meeting her and, um, and sort of thinking about what, a person like that brings to the a project like this that there's um, there's a kind of a focus that you know I've worked with a lot of non actors um, sort of specialists in their field who are brought into these narratives and asked to perform so to speak and it's often this uh, because there isn't a kind of um, dialogue to um, to carry the narrative um, it's often this sort of focus that needs to be encouraged out of a non-performer mm -hmm. when you put them on stage or put them in front of the camera. So, um, whereas Annette 
is sort of all about that, you know? She's sort of all about being still and slowing down her heart rate and focusing. And so it was quite, in that way, she was very easy to direct, and um, I appreciated that. Um, and interesting to pair her with dancers, because dancers are great at that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, Annette was the first person you cast? She was, and then the, the dance element, although I, it was something I certainly uh, wanted to explore with this piece, um, fell into place a little slower. Um, I had worked with Eleanor Bauer on River of Fundament. There was a short scene in that film where she presses a small man over her head. <laughs> um, and Eleanor is quite physical, very strong. And uh, so we started with this idea of um, sort of just thinking about the the sort of aspects of hunting, of listening, waiting, watching, uh, and thinking about putting her in a sort of uh, higher position to see and listen. And so um, that tree climbing scene was, de was developed first as, a, as an idea, and we set up a tree trunk in the studio, and Eleanor learned how to climb with the, the spikes and the lanyard and um, worked with a... Um, uh, specialist, um, and uh, and from there, um, I guess from there it was uh, it quite quickly got into this idea of uh, of bringing a more sort of explicit language of dance into it, which I think is something I've been wanting to do for a long time with a piece to really explore dance in that way, but. Coming through the back door this way was quite interesting, and I think satisfying for me. The back door being this, you know, placing dance in a place that it doesn't belong at all. Um, you know, in the deep snow and in, um, in you know, in a a kind of context where stillness is really important. And um, um, so that was really the initial question: how you know, how to develop a choreographic language out of not moving. Mm. And... Um, um, it must have been incredibly difficult mm. to dance in that environment. I think it was. I mean, a lot of the, those snow scenes were, were worked out in, indoors, um, maybe out in a flat field. And, uh, and as soon as we got up into location, it became a very different problem and eventually a very different uh, choreography, I would say. Mm. Did you have to ever change course because the con weather conditions changed? Uh, I mean, not really. Uh, I mean, we just went with it. Um, I mean, we took, kept an eye on the, the weather and there were certain scenes in the script that were um, ideally in in snow, and uh, and after the first day of s filming, if it was snowing in one scene, and we came back to that scene, we had to wait for a day to, mm -hmm. for, to for where it was snowing, for example. But so we moved the schedule around a lot due to weather. But uh, um, there was a lot of avalanche that year, and the um, and so there were locations that we actually couldn't get into because of uh, slides that had happened. So it was that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a choice, I think, to make a work in that environment in the dead of winter, and you know, there was a lot of um, improvisation and change that happened along the way because of it. Did you always think of the choreography as a narrative structure for the film, and did you have an order of events? laid out in advance. So the way that the dancers sort of foreshadow key events mm -hmm. and as the story unfolds, were those were there always an order, a first, second, third to that? Or did you um, put it together after some of the dances were realized? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, I think the script kept developing as, um, 
uh, Laura Stokes and KJ Holmes were cast, and we started working through their scenes. Um, uh, KJ's scene, for example, uh, I think was quite important to the, the bigger thinking, which was that she, as the electroplater and somehow as the character through which the narrative passes from the ground to the sky, um, that she would be the character who distills the entire narrative somehow or synthesizes everything that had happened. And, and so she was sort of taking the position um, of different characters in the, in the film or different scenes in the film. So to develop that, KJ looked at rushes of, you know, f uh, looked at some of the scenes that we had already filmed and, um, and uh, looked at the gestures that the other performers were, were taking and, um, and that became a way of, um, you know, it became the program for her choreography. Mm. The way that her KJ Holmes choreography, in particular, um, sort of weaves in and out of her um, electroplating process and mm -hmm. the construction of um, the lupus model in mm -hmm. the trailer mm -hmm. is um, so uh, structuring for the film. I think the sort of pointing to the sky with mm -hmm. her arm so dramatically at the beginning and again mm -hmm. at the end, um, sort of bookends, everything mm. in between. Yeah. Yeah, I think there was a, uh, this notion of trying to find ways of subtly bringing, uh, you know, movement out of the sort of more, let's say, tactical um, or practical uh, activities that each character was doing. And, um, 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 of course, her her uh, scene at the end is, is a much more explicit mm -hmm. uh, scene. But um, <clears throat> that was something I was interested in holding on to for the body of the film, to, to uh, let the language of, of dance you know, be the, almost like the dialogue in the film. Mm -hmm. um. how, how do you um, think about collaboration? How do you work with people. There are six characters in this film. You figure prominently mm -hmm. as the engraver. How did you think about your own role and how you wanted to perform? And was there a kind of um, evolution of your experience through working with the cast as a whole? Mm. Uh, well, the, the, the engraver was... Um, I mean, certainly a kind of distillation of the the Diana and Acteon mm -hmm. narrative. I sort of wanted for there to be this observer or, uh, you know, somebody who's out um, sort of capturing the landscape in a different way than Diana, but, um, but also a character who could transgress in some way. Um, and... Uh, I also wanted to find a way to, to, to bring the bureaucracy of the land management into the film in a more explicit way. So um, the engraver you know, became a US Forest Service employee uh, in that way. Um, I mean, the collaborations are there. Um, I mean, there's so many relationships in the making of a piece like this, and um, and they're all different, uh, and they all really inform the spirit of the piece for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the relationships, like I've been working with Peter Streetman, for example, since I was 22 years old. You know, like, I've, and we started out making a small format video uh, pieces that would just capture the of sort of performance of some sort of real time performance, and it grew slowly into cinema and Jonathan Bepler same I've been working with him for a, a long time and um, you know those uh, those relationships are um, uh, 
I mean, I think they require less um, kind of workshopping or, um, I mean, I think we can work from a, um, a conversation even or eventually a script and, um, and develop ideas out of it because we sort of know each other so well. I think when I'm working with a new performer, um, that kind of workshopping is quite, and especially with dance, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can sort of say the, you know, vaguely what I'm interested in, but it's really sort of hard to write dance, right? You sort of have to go in and um, and work with the person and um, and learn from them, and uh, yeah. I mean, I think there's something about dance that I I can um, I think I can relate to both uh, having been an athlete when I was younger. Uh, but also I think in the way that um, it relates to sculpture in a very direct way. Um, and the way that I want uh, action to kind of carry the narrative in, um, in these films, um, you know, dance is really able to do that, you know, without words. And it's, um, so in a way I kind of feel like I've been working with dance for a long time, but in, 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 in an explicit way, this sort of feels like the first time I've really committed to it. Mm. Mm. The layering and the, uh, of dance throughout the <clears throat> film and the way that dance structures the film makes things, makes the mundane activities like pouring coffee or unwrapping the brown paper from the plates very dance-like too. Mm. So there's a kind of um, inflection back on the everyday tasks mm -hmm. so that they're not um, sort of polarized into two different modes. There's a kind of um, subsuming of everything into uh, that very present, very embodied, mm -hmm. um, very conscious mm -hmm. dance-like mode. Yeah, those are also um, kind of edit editorial choices, you know, then, and Katie McQuarrie, who edited this piece, had dance background when yeah. she was younger. I think it was really helpful, actually. Yeah. Um, f even f for scenes, as you're saying, that are not explicitly about that. Yeah. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about um, your work with Jonathan Bepler and the score? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this one we talked initially about not using musical instruments. Um, which was interesting. It, it, uh, I think the thought was that somehow uh, the sound f of the place could end up being, uh, I mean, the sound design effectively could be the score. And, um, and, you know, we tried some things and talked about it and, you know, looked at some of the footage we were coming back with. And um, I think eventually it did affect how he chose to use instruments and the w certainly the way that it was mixed. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how in an environment like that you can hear something from a long way away and it has a, a presence. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's distant, but it's very present. Um, so I think, uh, although we didn't choose to do that literally through sound design, I think it did um, influence how Jonathan was thinking uh, about um, the music he, he wrote. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, through the years, we've worked together in so many different ways. You know, this piece was was made, was shot, and then um, given to him, at least as a rough cut. Um, River of Fundament, you know, we wrote scenes together that involved musicians and you would see what, you know, what was being played. Um, we designed certain scenes around a musical idea, so that, that's a very different way of working together. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's very interesting for a long-term collaboration, right, to, to see how it evolves from one project to the next. Mm -hmm. Would you say the same about the cinematography? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that's a long-term relationship and collaboration as well. Sure. And your yeah. approach has mm -hmm. changed. Definitely. Yeah, I think there, 
I mean, there was the 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 drone territory. I think in this piece was was new for us, and um, and it's something that Pete was working with a bit before, you know, leading up to the to this, and and had already shot a fair amount on drone. But um, the the idea of of a drone shot became really compelling to me, and just in terms of predation and uh, um, that kind of perspective. Um, so uh, that I think that tends to happen with every project that there's a kind of um, there's a kind of a, a cinematic idea that ends up being the kind of touching point for that piece, and it grows out from there somehow. Uh, uh, but also just, you know, shooting and there were days that were negative 30, negative 20, um, you know, running cameras in mm. that kind of environment is insane. So, it's, you know, to battery powered anything mm -hmm. is tricky. So um, I think there was a very limiting physical condition for camera work, um, setting up a camera in deep snow, um, getting a camera from point A to point B with some of those locations. So um, there's a way in which this piece had a kind of documentary program to begin with, and that's also true in the writing a little bit, but um, I think it really affected the way Pete designed the, the camera crew and how cameras are gonna work in this film. So, and it, it really contributes to, I think, the the way the piece looks and mm -hmm. well, so can you just describe what the setup looked like? How a lot was it minimal? How how many cameras? It, I mean, for starters, it's it was the snowmobile was the most critical piece yeah. of camera equipment. Actually, <laughs> it was like a snowmobile with a sled behind it and all of the camera gear piled up in that, mm -hmm. and uh, and in some cases lighting gear and another sled led by another snowmobile, <laughs> and then you got to get all the people to those locations by snowmobile. Um, but uh, then you gotta keep everything dry, right? So then you gotta lay out the big tarps and lay everything, I, I mean, it's kind of boring to talk about, but it's, <laughs> it was complicated. No, it sounds very complicated, and the um, shots of wildlife in particular mm -hmm. are so intimate mm -hmm. and, um, pristine and you have you know very you lose all sense of the apparatus that must have made those views possible as a, as a mm. person watching the film mm. um, you had talked at one point to me about how you decided on a, sort of the week structure the six seven day structure mm -hmm. um, and that had something to do with the hunting Outfitters telling you that that was about the minimum amount of, amount of time needed to track and, and hunt a wolf. Yeah, he said, I, I think when I came to him first, I met with him in the very beginning of the process, and I said, I, I would like to bring this film production um, on one of your hunts, um, and I would like it if you could track the wolves and bring them into the background of my shots. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me like, you're crazy. Um, and I said, well, how many days do you think we would need to kind of raise our chances of this happening? He was like, six. I was like, okay, <laughs> it's going to be six days. <laughs> That's great. That's but great. we, you know, we shot for however many days, never saw a single wolf. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's tricky. I think what I had in mind was not really possible. And we ended up having to go back and treat it more like a film and bring wolves in and... Um, um, The cosmic hunt myth is something that's interested you mm. um, very much, and it's very present in this project. Do you, do you want to talk about what that's... I guess I talked about it a little bit with regard to the electroplater, that I, I, I wanted to, I wanted for Redoubt to be like a cosmic hunt, where the, the, the hunter and the hunted are somehow transported you know, into another plane, in the case of a cosmic hunt, into the sky as a constellation. Um, and, and I would say in the case of this piece, 
there's sort of more about the uh, process of abstraction that happens in the electroplating bath. Um, although uh, there are certainly indications toward the sky with, uh, with the electroplater, but uh, um, yeah, that transformation was also a physical one um, through the electrochemical pro process. Um, so the film is one part of the project. Mm -hmm. The electroplates are another coming out of the engravings on copper. The sculpture are yet another. Can you talk a little bit about how you conceived of the parts of this project? <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's something that I tend to do, um, where a narrative is written, uh, and then objects grow out of that narrative. Um, although I, I, th I would say this does feel a little bit different from other works I've made, where the objects are more active within the film, within the story. Uh, this. Um, these pieces, the pieces using burned trees upstairs, um, I think for me were, they sort of, sort of came into focus while we were filming in those burned areas and uh, sort of looking at the, the kind of existential quality of those objects mm -hmm. and just sort of being surrounded by them constantly during the production that I wanted, um, to take something from that place and to use it as a host body uh, and to take my narrative through that host body. Um, and so I think it, right off the bat, this idea was to do with using those trees as a kind of a vessel mm -hmm. for um, sculpture making. and. Uh, so that sort of idea of pouring metal through a tree was um, came early, um, and then s you know slowly the the tree sort of took on the quality of the gun barrel and the rifling you have inside a barrel, and um, and the ideas became a little more art articulated. But I think the initial idea was really to do with the guest and host relationship mm -hmm. with the site. Mm -hmm. Well, given the prominence of the cosmic hunt myth in the project, I always think of the parts of the project, the film and the objects as, as sort of um, elements in a constellation that sort of exist as part of a bigger whole. They have some existence of themselves. And as you're talking, it makes me think about the wonderful way that you invite the various participants in the film in to sort of um, perform in their own mode, whether that mode be sharpshooting or um, aerial performance or um, hoop dancing. Um, and it's as if um, these sort of multiple fluencies come together in, again, a kind of constellation, the re essentially the Redoubt constellation. Mm -hmm. And that very much extends, it, to, to me, that is an extension, that's the point of connection between the film and the exhibition. And the way that the sculpture in the space really invites people in to essentially dance and participate in the choreography mm. of Redoubt as it occupies the space. Mm. So the immersive experience of the film that very much subsumes us as we're watching it continues as you move into the exhibition, but it continues in a spatialized way. Mm. So just as this, the score, the sound in this space is very spatialized and the expanse of the projection um, sort of relates to all of the seeing and the glances and the interest of optics that, that we're observing in the film. When you move into the space of the exhibition, the kind of movement around the life-size trees mm. in different orientations is um, 
It's like entering the redoubt. It's like entering this constellation that you have created. Is that um, Sounds good. fair enough? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think um, we are keeping, I understand, the gallery open, especially, so I hope that everybody will experience the exhibition. I did want to say, um, just as we're wrapping up, that you talked last night um, a little bit about the university context hmm. and the opportunity of bringing in different points of view and different voices. Hmm. And I think that's especially evident in the wonderful publication that you put together. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if just in closing, if you want to say a few words about the book. Yeah. And also I think the, the, the bit about making an exhibition in a learning institution, I think it definitely feels different. It does feel different to make a show when you know that um, the works and the installation will be used, used mm -hmm. by... Uh, by students and by classes, and um, you know that it has a, a, a function beyond its sort of own program, which mm -hmm. I think is uh, I think it's something that artists crave, at least artists that I know. You know, that people want to feel like they're making something useful, and um, so I, it, that struck me while I was installing here that uh, that this I've, I have never made an installation in a school, so it's this feels different. Um, but with regard to the book, um, yeah, I think it was one of the first things that uh, after coming and visiting um, and considering making an, a show here that it, it felt clear that it would be possible to um, work with the kind of broader Yale community and to make a more um, rigorous book. Um, and uh, And I think in the way that I was approaching the central Idaho landscape and the uh, sort of various voices that exist there. And um, um, I, I wanted for the book to also have a kind of objective quality to it. Um, so <clears throat> writers were in, invited to you know, write about the topic that they're specialists and so, for example, Arthur Middleton wrote about wolf ecology. That's his specialty in, in elk migration. And um, um, so the vision there, I think, was really just to sort of populate the book with these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, And I think it's something that would be it would be a difficult book to make in another um, environment, in another with another institution. It's a beautiful book, and I do think of it as um, an element in the constellation that makes up this project. And I do want to just point out that, in addition to the essays, there are incredible images in this book, and you had a very specific vision for the types of photographs that would re be reproduced, how they'd be sequenced, and what role they played in the volume. And I encourage you all to have a look. It really is stunning. Hmm. Do, you, do you want to talk at all about choosing those photographs and <clears throat> that, that program? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think what's Unusual in this book for me is the the section in the end where um, the process of the making of the works out in at the Walla Walla Foundry. Um, uh, I wanted to reveal the the process, uh, which I've, I haven't really tried in a book before. So um, um, that last section, uh, you know, was made from a, a kind of uh, compiling of images over the year that we took working on those sculptures. And um, I think it was also a chance to sort of bring in some of the source material that maybe in previous books would have found its way into the storyboard or um, um, the drawing somehow that I chose to design this section that would, um, that would inter 
change the process imagery with the source imagery and uh, and eventually the the finished views of the objects. Mm. Well, fr from the moment that you said you wanted to include process images, it never surprised me because I felt like so much of the story was about transformation. Mm -hmm. And just to take the um, monumental tree sculptures as an example, to go from a harvested, tr burned tree trunk to these magnificent sculptures, the, the transformative act is so key. And the process is a sort of story that you've built into the project. So there's this, again, this layering that is um, really resonant uh, through different parts of the project. Any last thoughts you want to share with the audience today? I think we've covered it. <laughs> well, it has been my great, great pleasure and privilege to work with you on this project, and I am so thankful to you, and the exhibition is, is beautiful, and I think we're all very grateful for you. And as I say, the galleries are open, so if you haven't seen the exhibition, please do go upstairs. It is well um, worth coming again and again. So thank you. Thanks. <clears throat>